Super. Crossing the river by feeling the stones. So we're going to go through quite a bit today. I'm going to start off uh, talking about um, the origin of how I got into mapping. Then I'm going to talk about what a map is. And then I'm going to talk about using them for learning. And then I'm going to talk about patterns in maps. And then we're going to talk about today and what's happening. And if we've got time, we're going to go on this horrendous journey at the end into the question of sovereignty. Now, I've got the Discord open as well. So if you want to ask questions as we go along, I'll try and keep a, an eye on my other screen over here as well. Um, but let's get started. We'll start with the origin. So this all began um, many, many years ago. It was uh, actually about 2004 um, at a company called Fatango. Um, a company I worked for, it was very profitable. Um, it had about 16 different lines of business, um, many, many users, rapidly growing, uh, but it had a big problem. And that problem was the CEO. Um, our CEO was completely clueless, making it up as they went along. They didn't have any idea what they were doing. Now, I know this um, because I was the CEO. I used to come up with these wonderful statements of, uh, you know, our future. This was us in 2003. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Um, I was um, I did a lot of stuff in the open source world. I, I, I actually know Kent Beck, who created extreme programming. We were early adopters of XP. Um, but <laughs> to be blunt, I'd pinch this from another company and just changed a few words. That's how bad I was. So I used to go around listening to other CEOs talking about strategy, and I used to record the words they would use. And uh, I, I called these words business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blahs for short. And these are the common blahs that I would hear things like digital business, big data. Well, this was, uh, I've done this years after me, uh, many, many times. This is probably about 2008. Uh, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage ecosystem, uh, open source, blah, blah, blah. And then what I did is I grabbed all these company strategies together and generated what I call the blah template. Our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I simply smashed the blahs and the blah templates together and also generated at random 64 different strategies. So our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative. It's just random gibberish. Uh, but I would send this around to people and they would respond to me. Uh, usually of three basic types. Uh, this is the exact wording from our business plan. Oh, the other one was I've seen two of these used already. Um, and <laughs> the last one, my favorite, was are you for hire? Um, but it's just random nonsense. Uh, a friend of mine has actually put this all online. Uh, this is strategy as a service. So if you ever need a strategy, I think it's down at the moment, but it doesn't matter. There's a better way now. Uh, you just you used to just go to the website, would create you one based upon nothing whatsoever. And if you didn't like it, you just just press refresh until you found one you you did like. Of course, the better way now is just ask ChatGPT. Uh, I have a vision of becoming a leading provider of mesh networks in rural farms. I don't, but there we are. Uh, can you please provide this as a modern vision statement, outline, high-level strategy? It does a really good job, actually. Uh, it, the gibberish it creates is just as good as the gibberish I used to create, um, which leads to the question, actually, uh, are CEOs facing a robot? I mean, the um, uh, World Economic Forum likes to go on about, well, actually, you know, CEOs are very creative and uh, critical reasoning and obviously um, large language model machines can't can't do that. And I mean, hallucination in large language models, um, uh, people think of it as a bug. It's also a feature when it comes to innovation. And I'm sure meta strategies for innovation will uh, if not already discovered will quickly soon be discovered. So I, I, I think we're on to a onto a losing battle there. But anyway, that's today. Uh, back in, uh, and just to give you an idea, um, some people have already made that step. So NetDragon replaced its CEO with an AI. Uh, this was back in September. It's a gaming company. It's outperformed the market. So, you know, there we are. Anyway, um, back in 2004, 2005, we're we quite, not quite there yet. Um, there I was running this company, completely lost, 
And I, I was in a bookstore uh, in Charing Cross and I was talking to the bookseller about how I didn't, uh, you know, I'd read all these strategy books and I was getting nowhere. And um, they said, have you ever read The Art of War by Sun Tzu? And I hadn't. So they they sold me two different versions of the book. They were a good bookseller. And I'm grateful for that because in the reading of the second one, I noticed a particular pattern. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One, have a purpose, a moral imperative to do something. Two, understand the landscape you're operating in. Three, understand the climactic pattern or the weather, how, how the landscape is changing. Then you get into doctrines. So these are principles of organization. And then you get into leadership, which is gameplay. And just at the same time, I was reading something else, which this overlapped with, uh, which is called The OODA Loop uh, by the mad major John Boyd, US Air Force pilot. So you've got the game. The first O of the OODA Loop is to observe the environment. And that's what landscape and climatic patterns are all about. And then you need to orientate yourself around the space. That's what principles and a doctrine is about. And then you need to decide what you're going to do, and then you need to act. And that's where gameplay. So I was like, wow, these sort of fit. And at the heart of this were two whys. The why of purpose. So if you think about playing game of chess, the why of purpose might be to win the game. And the why of movement, which is why do I make this decision over that decision? So why do I move this piece over that piece? I was really pleased with this. Uh, this must have been about 2000, beginning 2005. It sort of made sense to me. I did, still didn't have much of a clue, but I started to get interested in this question of landscape. And that's what got me into maps. So... I started to read everything I could find on military history. And one of my favorite battles is actually this one. This is the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. The Persians were invading. It's about 140 to 170,000 Persians. And what he decided to do was block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into a narrow pass called Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. Um, there are about 4,000 Greeks in the Greek army. There are independent city-states, including 300 Spartans, which is where we get the story of the 300 from. Now, I was fascinated by the use of this map to talk about where we need, you know, forces need to be, force multipliers, all that sort of stuff. So I started to look at myself and how I was making decisions in business. And I was using something called a SWOT diagram. So I thought I'd do a SWOT diagram of this map. So strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we're Athenian, we, we hate the Spartans. And the threats the Persians get rid of us and the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. Of course, we don't know what a film is at the time, but that's another story. Anyway, I just put these next to each other and asked the question, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement on a map or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram? I mean, it was like obvious. Why, why would, you know, of course you would use a, use a map. So why was I using a magic framework? So I asked everybody in the organization uh, to send me all the maps they had. And they sent me loads, systems maps, mind maps, uh, customer journey maps, business process maps, all sorts of maps. It's really sort of like, wow, we've got loads of maps. And I looked at one of the systems maps, and this is for an online photo service. Now simplify. And I took one of the components, I've graded it here, CRM, and I just simply moved it across the map like this. And I thought, what's changed? I've got to do it again because it's so exciting. There we are. It's over there. And I've moved it. What's changed? Well, nothing. Well, that's really odd because if I take Australia and shift it and put it next to the UK or I shift Canada and put it next to Australia, that's a really big change to that map. So what's, what's happened here? Um, well, the problem is... All of these maps had one thing in common. None of them are maps. They're all graphs. So to explain the difference, these three images at the top are all graphs, and they're all identical. 
They are three nodes, Nottingham, London, Dover, connected by two paths, uh, in this case, roads, the M1, M2. They're all identical. These three images at the bottom are all maps, and they're all completely different. Uh, again, it's three nodes connected by two, two paths, but the difference is, in a map, space has meaning, which is why they're good for trying to understand landscapes. Doesn't matter whether we're talking about territorial or economic or political or cultural or technological landscapes. So in a map, space has to have meaning. And that, that meaning comes from uh, having an anchor, such as Magnetic North, having the position of pieces, one relative to another, this is north, south, east or west of that, and having something known as consistency of movement. So if I'm going north, I'm actually going north. And if I'm going south, I'm going south. It's not the case that if I'm going north, I'm actually going south. OK, so you need anchor position and consistency of movement. So I thought I'd apply that to my business. Now, I, I, I don't usually do the business one because it's a bit dull. And I, I, I prefer um, tea shops. So the example I'll use is a tea shop. So if you think about a tea shop, who are the, what are the anchors? Well, there's two obvious users, the public who are consuming cups of tea and the business who wants to sell cups of tea. They both have a common need around the cup of tea. There are others like regulators, food regulators, etc. But let's anchor around the public and the business. OK, public and business, cup of tea. But cup of tea also has needs as well. It's not just the public need a cup of tea. Cup of tea needs tea. It needs a cup. It needs hot water. Hot water needs kettle. It needs cold water. And a kettle needs power. So what we've got is a chain of needs. And the further you go down the chain, the less visible something becomes. It's a metaphor for distance. So for the user, uh, the cup of tea is very visible. The power you use to heat the kettle, that's quite far removed. It's quite invisible to them. All right, so now what I've got is anchor and position, but I'm missing movement. Well, it turns out that all of these, and because this is currently a graph, uh, all of these components are forms of capital, and they evolve through a common pattern. You start off with the genesis of novel and new items, then you get custom-built examples and products and rental services, and commodity and utility services. Now, this is for activities. The same thing happens with knowledge, with uh, pros, uh, practices, um, even ethical values. But we give different terms that have the same characteristics, these four stages, but, but we just use different terms. So what I can do is I can take my graph and just simply ask questions about where how evolved something is. And now what I've got is a map. If I move any of the components, it changes the meaning of that map. I've got anchor, position, and movement. Now, normally we show it with a thick line at the bottom and a dotted line on the left-hand side. It's not a y-axis on the uh, on the. It's not, it's not a y-axis because it's actually within the chain itself. It's a partially ordered list. And so, what I'm now doing is exposing to you my assumptions on on a tea shop, and you can tell me all the components I'm missing, and you can say, "Why have you got kettle and custom built? Surely that should be a commodity." Now, that's quite a powerful thing. And the reason why it's powerful is because normally we run businesses with stories and we have entire industries telling people that to be a great leader, you've got to be a great storyteller. And that creates a problem, which is when you challenge somebody's story, you're actually saying you're not a great leader, which is why they get defensive. Um, we like to think we're good at challenge. We tend not to be. If you take the story and put it in a mapping format, I can just say, I think there's something wrong with the map. I'm not challenging you anymore. I'm saying there's a problem with the map. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, this is an insurance company. Uh, this is about 2011. Uh, this is their process flow for getting compute into their data center. Um, they need compute. They order server. Server goes into goods in. They modify mountain racket. Now, they had a bottleneck in their, their chain, uh, which was to modify mounting servers into their racks. Um, this was slowing them down, so they put a team together. They looked at this problem for about six months. They built a wonderful business case around this, return investment calculations, all this. It was all beautiful stuff. Uh, lots of vendors in, came up with a plan, and they're about to do the robotics. And they, they asked, well, I was asked to come and have a look at this. 
Now, I can't challenge their story. I don't want to undermine them. I don't want to get into that fight. So I said, could we map this? And they were like, oh, don't see the point of that. But a little bit of persuasion. Uh, we spent 15 minutes mapping it. This is the map. User needs compute. Compute uh, needs them to order server, server goods. And it's exactly the same as the process flow. Um, Compute, they thought, was a product. I would argue it was a commodity in 2011, but OK. Order server, server goods in. Somehow server is a commodity, but compute isn't. A bit strange, but order server, fine, it's a commodity. And then they went rack mount modify. And I simply looked at that and thought, why have you got rack in custom built? And they went, oh, we have custom built racks. Ah. So what are the modifications you're making to service? Well, they don't fit our racks. So we have to take cases off, drill new holes, add new plates. Ah. And that's why you need robotics, yes. And then somebody in the room just went, hang on, why are we using standard racks? <laughs> now, it, it, these people aren't daft. They are simply trapped by context, trapped by a past story. At some point in the past, it made sense. Of course, once this, you'd expose this, or once I'd expose this, it wasn't long before they said, what are we doing with compute and data centers? Why aren't we using a cloud service, shift it to a utility? This was back in 2011. What they were doing is they, and this is so common, um, optimizing process flow without considering evolutionary flow. So they're looking at the existing process and trying to make it more efficient, um, which would make you go and spend millions on robotics, <laughs> rather than asking, looking at the space and going, hang on, that's evolved. We shouldn't be doing it this way. Now, my sort of mapping has been used from everything from sexual health campaigns and in uh, Colombia to, to putting uh, uh, Planet Labs and JPL working together, NASA putting satellites up in space to did a lot of this sort of stuff in the UK government. And one project alone, we saved about 425 million. Um, but one of the things I find most fun about maps is not just the fact that you can now get people's stories into a map and you can challenge what we're doing. And you often find this, you know, we're doing strange things. And it also forces people to think about the users, the needs, and the components involved, but also the learning. So to explain that, um, this is HS2 High Speed Rail. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, James Findlay, uh, who used to be the CIO of HS2. And back in 2012, he had a problem. Uh, they wanted to build the entire railway in a virtual world because it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we've got that wrong, than it is the English countryside. So this is their systems graph for building, it's not a map, it's a graph, for building HS2 in a virtual world. And the problem was this, normally in government at that time, we would outsource all the components and we would organize them into what we thought were sensible structure uh, contracts. So we'd have like lot one engineering. We'll have all the engineering -y stuff in there. People can bid on that. And lot two user experience. We'll have a contract for that or the user experience. And these projects were always massive cost overruns, problems, etc. And so what James did, he sat down and it was a Sunday lunch, Sunday afternoon or something like that. And he just mapped it. And he sent it to me. Um, this is the modified version of that map. It's 2012. And he said to me, how do you manage something like this? I thought, well, this is easy because I'd faced this problem in 2006. Um, what we'd learned is that as things evolve, because everything's moving from the left to the right-hand side, things evolve across the map with supply and demand competition. As things evolve, their characteristics change. So they go from this uncharted world, doesn't matter whether it's compute or money or penicillin, um, it's uncertain, it's chaotic, and eventually becomes more industrialized. And those change of characteristics means there's no such thing as one size fits all methodology. In fact, um, what we'd learned, because we'd, we'd gone all extreme programming and then discovered it doesn't work everywhere, um, we need to use things like extreme programming is very good on the left, uh, so agile because it's good at reducing the cost of change and in the uncharted space change is normal uh, but on the right hand side things like six sigma you know waterfall works really well outsourcing because it's all about reducing deviation deviation is not what you want um in the middle things like scrum mvp lean seems to work really well because it's all about learning and reducing waste so we'd learn to use multiple methods so we simply did that we just said like 
stuff on the left hand side use agile techniques extreme programming in house stuff in the middle you, if you're going to build it use lean otherwise you know go and get off the shelf products stuff on the right hand hand side outsource uh if you're going to build mm, oh, well, try and be a provider to others use things like six sigma um and so that's exactly what they did. And this ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee because this project was delivered way under budget and way ahead of schedule. Um, but what I want to do also show you is let's go back to their, their original sort of idea. If we take one of those um, contracts and we'll take lot one engineering, it's very difficult here to see what's going to go wrong. But if I overlay this on a map, so I'm going to take lot one engineering and overlay it on a map, I can tell you right now that this contract is going to fail. And the reason why it's going to fail is because the bits on the right hand side, we can define well, which means they're good for a contract. We can specify them and everything else. But the bits on the left will always incur excessive change control costs because we can't define them. Well, we've, we've just, you know, we shouldn't be putting them in the same thing. If we want to organize things in contracts, we should like combine all the commodity stuff. And there's a whole bunch of practices we can use over there. And then, you know, if you want time material base, that's, you stick the agile stuff in. A, so you use entirely different purchasing mechanisms. Um, one thing I just really want to emphasize, there's a world of difference between using agile, things like extreme programming, and being agile. Uh, being agile requires you to use appropriate methods. I mean, if you're building a house, you don't go and agile all the bricks. Okay. Um, so in terms of learning, uh, one of the things we do, or I do with maps is pre-mortem challenge. This is like, why are we custom building racks? Why have we got a custom built kettle? Uh, so we use the maps for pre-mortem challenge. Then we go and build something. And afterwards we come back and look at what we've built and look at the map and see if we can, was there anything to learn? And from that, we learn pants. So which brings me to the next bit, conveniently, of my talk. So there are three basic patterns that you learn. And uh, there are climactic patterns. These are the, like the rules of the game. Uh, they're going to happen regardless of whether you like it or not. So things are going to evolve. Um, there's a 30 of them. But if you know them, they're useful for anticipation. Then there's um, principles. These are principles of organization. Things, um, you know, are generally useful principles. So uh, focus on the users, focus on the user needs, um, um, understand the components involved, understand how evolved the components are, manage inertia. There's about 40 of those. And then you've got leadership. These are gameplay. These are context specific. So unlike principles, which are universally useful, these apply in certain places of the map uh, and they can have a positive effect if you apply them in the right area and a negative effect if you apply them in the wrong area and so they're called gameplay and there's about 110 of those and most people are oblivious to all of this stuff so to give you an example this is compute 2005 i'm going to go through the climate some of the climatic patterns just a few of them uh, so user needs an application built on best coding practice. Uh, you can map practices and uh, activities, knowledge, and ethical values all at the same time. Um, the best coding practice was built on a runtime, lamp.net, on an operating system, on best architectural practice for computers of product. So that's roughly 2005. And we knew, because one, one of the patterns we'd learned was that everything evolves. So we knew it was going to become a utility. And sure enough, uh, um, it was AWS. I thought it was going to be Google, actually. But Amazon came out with, uh, started providing things as uh, uh, as a service. I mean, it was storage and uh, um, uh, message queues first. And, and then it was compute uh, with EC2 in 2006. Um, it was actually built, yes, it, 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 a friend of mine is Ben Black, uh, who, who actually proposed this stuff back in 2003 to Jeff uh, Bezos, but uh, that's, a, that's another story. But anyway, compute became a utility 2006. Um, and there's another pattern we've learnt, is the past success breeds inertia. So if you're good in the past world, you tend to have inertia to this change. And that there's about 16 different forms from political capital, you know, installed base, so, you know, spent capital, capital you've got, like a data center, uh, existing practices, all creates inertia to this change. 
Um, the classic example is to think of Blockbuster versus Netflix. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. Um, Blockbuster, uh, Netflix, uh, who was first with a website? Can they, somebody just dive into Discord? Netflix? Uh, no, no. Blockbuster was first with a website. Uh, who was who was um, first with video ordering l- online, Blockbuster or Netflix? Blockbuster. Blockbuster. Blockbuster was, yeah. Who was first with video streaming experiments? Blockbuster. Blockbuster, yay. Who went bankrupt first? <laughs> uh, Blockbuster, <laughs> yay. Um, so Block- <laughs> Blockbuster out-innovated everybody. Uh, the problem is uh, it had inertia created by its existing business model. It basically made money from late fees. So... Not everybody will remember back back in that you can read up in this stuff in museums, I'm afraid. Back then, we used to have things called video cassettes, which we'd go and get from the store uh, and put in a machine and watch a film and then forget to take it back the next day. And they would charge us more, more money. That's how Blockbuster made most of its money. Um, so it had inertia, whereas Netflix was a DVD online, well, a mail ordering company uh, for DVD. So it had none of the inertia. Inertia is a really quite dangerous thing, actually. It kills a lot of companies. Okay, the next pattern you learn, uh, things evolve, we have inertia, is coevolution. So as things evolve, their characteristics change. And so practices change as well. So when compute was a product, uh, we used to have practices, well, the characteristic was high mean time to recovery. When your server went bang, it would take months to get a new one. So we used to do lots of disaster recovery and plus one capacity planning, all that sort of stuff. As compute became a utility, uh, it, it went from high to low MTTR. So, you know, speed at which you get a new machine is now seconds. So you distribute systems designed for failure, chaos engines. We start doing continuous deployment. You can't do continuous deployment when you're sitting there for a month waiting for a machine to turn up. Um, Eventually, those emerging practices, Andy and Patrick uh, gave it a name. They called it DevOps. Uh, but uh, we uh, we also learned that efficiency enables innovation. Turns out that if you commoditize underlying components, it's quicker to build things on top. So, for example, uh, if you've got bricks, it's quicker to build houses. And those higher order systems create new sources of value and worth. So those are like powerful forces. So in 2008, I was running a strategy for a company called Canonical. They provide something called Ubuntu. Uh, it's an operating system. And uh, we simply, it's slightly more complex than this. We, we used a more complex map. And um, we looked at the map and simply go, right, well, we know it's going to go cloud. We know there's going to be emerging practice. We don't know what it's going to be called. We know there's going to be new things created. That's where we want to go. And also where where we shouldn't invest our time and money, uh, the stuff stuck behind the inertia barriers like data centers and uh, uh, best architectural practice in that world. So we were about two to three percent the operating system market. Um, I spent uh, about half a million, took us 18 months and we were up against Microsoft and Red Hat. We had none of their resources, but we took 70 percent of all cloud. Um, so by about 2010, pretty much uh, you know, we dominated the cloud space. So it wasn't because we were geniuses and everything else. Well, actually, some of the engineers were absolutely genius. I certainly wasn't. Uh, it's just, well, we, almost we were cheating. We had a map and uh, competing against people who, who didn't seem to see the environment. Of course, by 2010, that emerging practice had been called DevOps, best architectural practice for computers and product, got a new name. It was called Legacy. Uh, 2014... Uh, the runtime uh, started to evolve. Uh, so we went from lamp.net, so it became more of a utility with things like Lambda. And of course, you see the same thing again. You get an emerging practice, eventually gets, gets a name, gets called FinOps. You get the rapid development of new things built on top. And of course, all the underlying stuff, um, you know, uh, you know where, where your focus, your strategy is now changed because... Um, whereas cloud and DevOps, that, you know, that's where you want to go 2008. By the time you get to 2016, that's becoming sort of the new legacy. I mean, we're 2023 now. If you were about to kick off a DevOps program today, uh, by the time you get it up and run and get rid of your data centers, et cetera, and, and somebody like Netflix took seven years to do that, uh, that's 2030. Well, you've just created the new legacy. Um, 
you know, everything is already shifting into that sort of serverless space. Oh, question. 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, ben Ben Black proposed EC2. Gosh, it was 2003. Uh, it was Chris Pinkham and others built it in South Africa. And it was built as a standalone service. You can hear these stories about Amazon selling its spare capacity. No, uh, Jesse is a friend of mine, was the master of disaster running Amazon's data centers. He, he quite happily says, you know, so he won't mind me saying, he said, you're not coming anywhere near our data center with this stuff, uh, which is probably a good thing. So they never were selling spare capacity. Um, it may have changed now, but that's well, certainly not the origin. So 2016, anyway, you know, your strategy changes. And you can read all about this sort of stuff. Um, there's a wonderful book by Dave Anderson called The Flywheel Effect. Uh, which talks about you know the serverless and those changes so let's talk about today then all right so you've got the map of the space uh 2016 i'm just going to make most of the map disappear because i'm not really interested in talking about infrastructure and all that because you know it's below the barrier of serverless i'm really just code and above i have no interest in yeah, I'm sorry, Kubernetes and all that sort of stuff. I mean, um, none. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to expand it out a little bit more. Um, application coding environment, FinOps is the practice serverless. So we've moved it on a little bit 2018. Well, what happened in 2018, particularly interesting, is large language models were starting to, to industrialize pretty quickly. Um, they're certainly now heading, you know, you look at something like stability AI and all the, the sort of work that's being done. And it's, it's well into the uh, late product heading towards commodity stage. Um, but one of the things we would be talking about during this time was the combination of those to create conversational programming environments. Now, example of this was demonstrated at AWS by a good friend of mine, Alexander, um, in 2018. So this is Jen, uh, Jarvis, sorry. And uh, Jarvis um, was basically a large language model trained on the AWS APIs. And it also trained in terms of uh, um, um, basically development, stitching together of APIs. And so what Alexander demonstrated um, was his ability to have a conversation. In this case, it was verbal. It doesn't have to be um, uh, with the system and a conversation of like, build me an airline tra uh, tracking system. And uh, it would ask questions and he'd talk about the components needed. And literally, it would build the system for him. So the process of engineering had actually become a conversation uh, between Alexander and, and the system. And you see this more recently now. You're getting there with things like uh, Copilot, GitHub, et cetera. Um, but the origin of this stuff goes all the way back to Nicholas Negroponte's uh, wonderful paper called Architecture by Yourself. Um, which a lot of the ideas come from a fantastic um, a book, quite old book by Jonah Friedman uh, called Towards a Scientific Architecture. And to, just to spell it out, what it basically is, is the design process can be viewed as a conversation. So they're talking about architecture and the use of computer interface and how architects can work together to build a particular system through a graphical interface. Well, what's happened is one of the designers is the machine today. That's what's going on. It's, it's no longer, you know, us talking with others through the graphical interface. Um, we're using the machine has become part of that. And that's what we mean by how conversational programming. We're getting to the point that programming is not going to be the way we used to think of it. It's us having a conversation with the machine to build the system. Now, at the moment, we're quite stuck in the text code base world. Um, I just want to show um, a graphical example. This is a, a particular map uh, which was done by, uh, it looks at coherent city transport. So there's almost no technology on here. It's all about things like fuel and bikes and drones. And uh, there's things like autonomous vehicles, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of city planners uh, from Budapest to Dusseldorf to all over the world, actually, coming together to describe um, the concept of coherent city transport and lots of discussion about the ways, means, and uh, so, you know, the mode of transport, drones, vehicles. Um, but what was interesting in this discussion is that it was realized that internet access was a mode of transport and cables and air were ways. A, virtual is a transportation system. 
Um, and it has a material impact on other transportation systems. I mean, I'm transported thousands of miles to, to speak to you now. I haven't had to use a plane or anything along those lines. And so a lot of cities, we've been designing digital twins, uh, which, you know, does lots of interesting things with roads and, and canals and other bits and pieces. Uh, but they've mostly been missing one of the major transportation systems, <laughs> which is virtual itself. Um, and if you want to look at things like congestion, um, uh, you know, this is what 50 people look like in 33 cars on a road, 50 people a bus, 50 cyclists, 50 pedestrians. Uh, that's 50 people in a virtual space. Um, so virtual is a, a transportation system itself. But the point about this is we could have this conversation about this complicated and complex environment through the medium of a map. And businesses are like that as well. And if you think that one of your designers or you know, your city planners is going to be the machine, well, the way to avoid you being replaced uh, by uh, an AI uh, is to stop being a CEO who doesn't actually understand the landscape and start having a conversation with the machine in a medium that you can both use to describe a complicated and complex environment. And that medium will be graphical. It might be like my maps, or it might be a different form of map, but it'll be something graphical. Um, and why should you do this? Because uh, of things like gameplay. I said there's 110 different forms of gameplay. Um, I'm not going to mention them all. We don't have time. I'm going to mention one. But people are actively doing this sort of stuff already. So I'll show you one gameplay. It's called ILC, Innovate, Leverage, Commoditize. I wrote about it in 2005, 2006. You take a product, you turn it into a utility. Uh, we'll pick a random product. We'll say compute. Uh, we'll give it a name. Let's, let's give our compute. Okay, let's call it EC2, just a random name. All right. Uh, then what will happen is you expose it as an API and everybody builds on top. Yay, they can build new things really quickly. Componentization, you know, that that pattern we learned, you know, efficiency enables innovation. Great. Uh, people will build things like kit and internet, completely useless. Uh, some people will build big data. Ah, oh. now you've got to build them uh, because you're charging them for the service. So you're billing the metadata tells you everything you need to know about what's becoming interesting in the marketplace. Uh -huh. So you see big data is becoming interesting. Uh, you leverage the entire system. And so you think we'll provide big data as a service. Uh, let's give it a random name. We'll call it, I don't know, Elastic Map Reduce. Now, everybody will go, yay, because we can build new things, except for the people who you just eat in their business model. And they'll go, oh, you're really bad. We should have special licenses that you can't use our stuff or whatever. Um, but everybody else cheers and society progresses. Uh, what we're actually doing is um, everybody who's building on these services is, is your re free research and development lab. They're innovating. Um, you're, you're mining metadata, leveraging the entire ecosystem to spot future patterns, and you're commoditizing to component services. So your rate of innovation or apparent rate of innovation, customer focus and efficiency, will now all increase with the size of the ecosystem. And this drives society as a whole forward. You know, you can't sit there doing rent extraction on a product because you, you'd just be industrialized now. Um, and what you do is you simply snake up the... the, the um, supply chain you start off with compute build things on top machine learning engines machine learning platforms discrete services you can read all about this as i said i wrote about it in uh 2005 2006 there's a wonderful book it's the i think it was the second ever book produced by aws itself uh called reaching cloud velocity i would recommend you read this great book uh by by two strategists in there and they've got 17 pages of mapping in there including the the ilc model um uh which is basically how you chew up industry after industry um now it's not only companies who play these sorts of games it's also governments as well uh china is particularly good at that now at this point i can get into the wild mess of sovereignty we've just got enough time to show you the horror of that problem or if there are specific questions, I could stop and answer those. So what do you want to do? Do you want to go into sovereignty? Or, let, let, or, or... Let, let's just keep blowing minds. Go for it. <laughs> go, go for it. All right. OK, sovereignty. All right. Normally, we talk about territorial sovereignty. Uh, and, and we're good at that. Uh, we use maps. 
And we start off with, here's our collective, our nation, whatever it happens to be, and here's our border. And outside that border, there are others. We're in here, our, our values, our behaviors, all this sort of stuff. Right, great. Um, but the thing is, we don't just compete in the landscape of territory. We compete in economic landscapes, uh, political landscapes, um, cultural landscapes, technological landscapes. But we're very good at maps in the territory. Um, but you can map economic systems. So this is back, us back in um, July 2015. Future eye view. Oh, no, no, it's future view, spelling mistake. This is the DVLA. Um, it's licensing authority in the UK. Uh, we'd mapped out um, basically automotive, and we'd push this map forward into the future. And when pushing this map forward into the future, this was about 2025, 2030, we'd, we'd said basically cars and all these components are going to become much more of a commodity. And that's a problem because... Uh, car retailers, automotive companies want to create status for their vehicles. And so we said, well, you know, they'll probably try and recreate status with a digital subscription model tied to things like design, infotainment, route management. And sure enough, I think it was in 2018, 2019, BMW came out with a patent for digital subscription model and then Ford put a patent forward for route management. So, yeah, we know they're going there. <laughs> And what do we mean by this? Well, it means that in the future, you won't own your car. You'll just have a digital subscription model. Uh, you know, you might be gold members, I might be bronze, which means we'll get in the same car and you'll have a lovely gold experience. And I'll have wall to wall adverts as this car drives me to where I'm going. But that's not actually the big problem. The big problem is the route management. So gold member comes along and there's a bunch of us bronze members up in front. And what will happen is our vehicles will get out of the way. So gold member gets to wherever they're going faster. And we've just embedded social inequality into the transportation system. And why does that matter? Well, it means when we have a flood, everybody is a gold member. They, they get out of the way. And everybody who's like a bronze member or whatever is sitting there waiting for their vehicle, which is never going to turn up to turn up. Well, they're stuck in a queue on the side watching all these other people go past who are gold members. And so the next day, what that means is pitchforks. And from government point of view, that's not a good idea. So, you know, you've got to basically be thinking social inequality, blah, blah, blah. We've got to manage this before because the market's too daft. I mean, they don't think like that. Uh, but what's interesting is when you took that map and you looked at China's actions, you start seeing where they're doing all strategic investment. It's all on the commodity stuff, building up the stack. And they've been doing this uh, for quite a significant amount of time. So this is the US versus China import-export ratios, 1993. Uh, and you can see um, what's basically happened since 1993 to 2013 is they've just moved literally up the stack. I should get rid of that arrow. You could actually see the figures then. Just, you know, it's easy, easy to create these numbers. Anyway, so you've got competition going on in the economic space, but you've also got something else going on. Because if you think about cars... Uh, the users are part of a collective, a nation, and that nation has values. And we tend to embed our values in the simulation models, which we train our AIs on. So if you know the, um, the trolley problem, cars, you know, trolleys come along, kill one person or three people, what do you do? Well, if you're a sort of more Confucian society, it's tough luck for the one person, the three survive. If you're a uh, more, I don't financially motivated society and uh, the one person's a billionaire and the three other people are unemployed it's tough luck for the three people you know we embed the values that we have within the simulation models of the systems we are training now maybe we want to make sure the right values or the values of that our collective whichever collective that is has are the ones being, um, the systems are being trained on. This is why you have this whole Washington versus Beijing AI um, sort of uh, um, ethical models. So there's different models that they're, they're competing on. Um, but what we're doing basically is a, a nation or as a collective, we should be probably saying or working out which are the bits that we have a real big interest in uh, and uh, where we want our borders to be. The rest of the stuff, 
we might say we're happy to cooperate over there we're happy to collaborate over there uh, this stuff we might conflict we might say sorry no you can't you know we need to control that bit but this is what we mean by um, digital sovereignty, which is just part of technology. And competition, remember, competition is the act of just seeking as a group. Uh, and this, you can either seeking with others. You can either do it by fighting with others, which is conflict, or collaborating, laboring with others, or, or cooperating. And often on a map, you'll do multiple at the same time with different parties. A bit like a territorial map where you might be conflicting with some and allies with others, etc. It's the same thing the problem is is we have all these wonderful conversations uh and certainly about digital sovereignty and i go and talk to people and they say oh yeah digital sovereignty is really important i say well, great what does it mean and they go oh, it's all about the data and you go fine which data well all the data oh that's like turning up to a general and saying oh, we're talking about territorial sovereignty and having a general turn around and say it's all about the trees which trees? All the trees. No, it's not. I mean, they would never happen because they would tell you, you know, it's all about borders and landscapes and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, um, economic political systems, we don't tend to have that. So one of the big questions you should have, actually, is where are your maps, radars and situation rooms for the economic, political, cultural and technological landscapes? Because we're, we're good at the territorial stuff. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a military... Uh, uh, um, any sort of defense department um ministry of defense or you know department of defense or whatever it happens to be i mean there's no point in fighting just one landscape if you can ignore the other four it's a it's a bit like um you know we're seeing in ukraine at the moment obviously china's starting to stop export of things like cotton liners but they're used in 155 millimeter hammers of shells. So, you know, we're starting to have all sorts of supply chain impacts because these are important territories. It's not just the territorial and kinetic. And um, by that, I don't mean it's not just land, air, sea, space. Uh, I mean, these other landscapes are also part of sovereignty and defense of the realm. Um, but generally, I find that most, most uh, organizations, whether government or, or companies, companies, pretty awful at their supply chains as well um have little to no uh view in in the landscapes that are actually competing in which is why people like me can come along and take a company like ubuntu take 70 percent of cloud for and next to nothing anyway so we started with um the origin uh i started having not a clue about what i was doing i'm not saying i do have a clue now i just have more of a clue than back then all maps by the way imperfect representations of a space just remember no such thing as a perfect map even territories i mean a, a map of france uh, to be perfect it would have to be the same scale as france uh, so one to one you know uh which as a map would be useless because you'd be carrying france around in your pocket to look at front oh, well, what's the point so all maps are perfect they're all models as well so they're all wrong uh but they tend to be useful anyway so i started off with the origin not knowing what i needed to do got into um uh, um, uh, the idea of maps and what is a map and found that most of the things I had were graphs, not maps. Um, started building maps, started learning from maps, found I could use them to, to basically, you know, um, challenge what I was doing. And unlike a business case, which I tend to put on the wall and never see again, I would actively go back to the map after we built stuff and look at what happened. And that's where I learned patterns. And uh, there are three basic types, the climatic, uh, the, the principles, doctrine, the sort of uh, uh, gameplay. And you can all, you know, climatic ones are interesting for, for helping you anticipate change. And so, you know, that's a lot of what we did at Canonical Ubuntu, which is how we knew where to attack. And today, you know, that's, you can use it to see what's going on. And we're heading down this path of conversational programming, where you're going to have this, you know, engineers in conversation with the system building, you know, um, you know, there's still be out, people out there trying to get robots to do custom built racks and all the rest of it. And the people doing Kubernetes or whatever. And then there'll be these other people be just moving at light speed in comparison um, because they won't be worrying about any of that sort of stuff. Uh, but this stuff is not just about business and technology. It also has big implications uh, for sovereignty as well, where we're pretty poor at mapping uh, most of the landscapes we compete in. Anyway, I called it Crossing the River by Feeding the Stones. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, um, famous economist and leader, um, 
uh, basically uh, a phrase of his. It's about sort of have an idea of where you're going uh, and uh, um, you, you, you move by understanding the landscape. And I, I just thought that was apt. Anyway, I'm Simon Ward. Uh, I, I research for a company called Dixie. I've burnt your entire hour. But you can always put, I can hang around and you can just ask questions in Discord. I'm happy to answer. You'll always find me on Twitter, at Swardley. Um, I'm also on uh, Blue Sky as well, playing around with it as well. You're, you're, uh, every, you're everywhere. I tagged you this morning. Oh, <laughs> but there uh, you are. I'm I think we're going to go. We're going to take a little time. We'll push things a little back and take a couple questions. Oh, the canonical first question arrives, please. Hi, Simon. Uh, really good talk. Um, uh, so these maps, as I understand it, these maps are a good way of taking a graph and turning it into a map. Um, yeah. And there's kind of, not really implicit, like an explicit sense of time to these. Like you take a snapshot of the graph, and then there's also this things tend to flow rightward. Yeah. And there are a couple of points where it's like, oh yeah. And then this one like moves over here and yeah. we guessed that. And so we did great. Is that like, no, is there any art? Is that all art or is there like some, some more going on there? That, uh, oh, that oh, rightward oh, movement. Okay. Okay. Really good question. I'm going to have to share my screen again. Hang on. So let me share my screen. Uh, let's go back a couple of pages do, 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 to any map. There we are. Right. Um, Oh, can I draw on this? Hang on. That would be helpful. Annotate. Yes, I can. Squiggle over there. Oh, good, good, good. Right. Um, this Genesis custom built product commodity um, I built by, um, it was actually back in 2005 by doing text analysis on 9,223 publications. I, I spent ages looking for a way of describing movement and, and found this particular pattern. Um, uh, and there's a whole piece of work on that, which there's not time to go for, uh, which is all to do with changes in publication types. And basically what happens if there's supply and demand competition, then whatever component that you're looking at is going to move in this direction over time. Now, this is actually a bad map because normally maps on here will say something like 2015. And maybe if it's looking forward, it might say 2030. Because what happens is there is no time on the map, because in order to create this pattern of evolution, I had to abolish the concept of time. It wasn't, you know, you can't, I, I, I found, didn't find a way of making a crystal ball. Um, so I had to get rid of the concept of time. And that enabled me actually to find this particular pattern. And so what I can say is, look, all of these components, digital subscription models will start off, you know, over there and eventually become you, you you know cars are now over here at some point in the past they were over there you know etc cetera, etc cetera. fabrication 3d printing techniques were over here back in what 1968 the first 3d printer uh cpus oh, you know, back over you know long ago uh so uh what we've got is is a snapshot in time so there's no time other than the fact this is when the map was created. Now, all these maps are in perfect representations. What will happen is as components evolve, um, they enable higher order systems to appear. So they enable things to be built on top. Um, so it's not a case that you find, um, you know, CPUs suddenly reappear over here. Um, it's, they still become a commodity. We just find, well, we start building things on top, we stop worrying about them, or we just focus on, you know, uh, uh, very defined characteristics of the commodity now. Uh, so it's about, you know, frequency, or it might be, you know, if it's memory, it's, you know, how much gigabytes, the terabytes, then uh, um, it, it's all become commodity-like. I think CPUs mm -hmm. are actually a great example. One of the things that I'm tracking in my mental map yeah. is, is risk five. Yeah. India and China. So yep. the map has changed where CPUs have been a high IP, uh, highly closed systems with yep. licensing and other things like that. And of yep. course, Apple, Apple has decided to vertically integrate in different ways. Yep. Uh, now at a sovereign level, risk five, and the hypothesis is much like Ubuntu, that a completely open system will allow certain actors yeah. Uh, to take something that was top right Genesis 
further along and apply a set of techniques around what does it mean to build risk five. And our hypothesis is yeah. that that will do a lot of things from left to right relatively quickly with large actors in place. No, no, I, I, okay. So I'm trying to, to zoom back to a map, which I can, oh, I can use this one. Right, we'll, 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 oh, right, we'll just use this one. Okay. Um, open source is one of those um, gameplays, by the way. As I said, there's about 110 of them. And one of the things um, open source is really good at, it's great for driving things from left to right. It, it, it um, increases supply and demand competition by reducing barriers to entry, uh, allowing more people and uh, to actually consume it and also to get into the market as well. So you look at open source as an accelerator. Uh, people often think, oh, you build novel and new things with open source. Actually, open source doesn't make a great deal of difference compared to proprietary over here. Uh, the real power of open source is its ability to drive things from left to right. And so when you map out a competitor, you'll often think, right, we want to sap their strength. So let's go and identify a few components which they're dependent upon. We're going to open source in that space. Well, we'll do a couple of calculations to work out. Should we, because that'll weaken them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you you can get them you can play all sorts of games with other companies who are completely oblivious to this is actually going on uh, so open source is one of the most powerful strategic weapons and one of them i mean ilc is a, you know, a fantastic that actually there's about 110 different weapons um but um uh, i i do like that sort of open source play the thing is once something's become more of a commodity so like cpu it's it's um uh, we tend to build higher up, up order systems, um, and so things get usually get get buried so far below that they get forgotten about. But that doesn't mean they're not important. And uh, if you can, there's all sorts of games you can play with capturing supply chains. And if you can capture those, you can have great control on others and their ability to move as well. So at that point, you're definitely into the nation state stuff. It's like um, you know, uh, people saying, oh, Russia, you're using our chips in your your missiles. We're going to stop you doing that. And Russia turns around, we're going to stop you using our helium then, uh, which we use in microfabs and chip manufacturer. But so there's all these complicated interconnected components and, and people can play some pretty, um, uh, um, oh, well, uh, deft games, shall we say, uh, with this stuff, if you if you understand uh, the particular space. So, yes, there has, I, I must admit, I'm really, um, Biden's recent announcements um, really do point to the fact there's a gr much greater understanding of the importance of these other landscapes uh, in, in this. So I'm really encouraged, really, really positive about uh, uh, his recent announcements. Um, uh, because often it's been just like we'll leave it to the market, um, which is, um, well, it, shall we say it's not the game that China has played, and China is, is now literally out in a, well, of the 44 core technologies we know of, I think they lead in 39 of them now. Um, so we've got to up our game somehow. And and part of that is, is by um, not just being uh, just waiting for the market to do it, but directing and pushing in directions that we need to go. So um, anyway, long winded. And I've definitely, oh, I've, I've, I've way we're, too we're, much time. I'm we're, sorry. We're, we're going to, no, no problem. We're going to take one more question. No, last one. no I'm, I'm massively <laughs> overrunning. Super quick, super quick question. Simon, a uh, huge fan of yours. Where does one go to learn the rest of the framework aside from the maps? So the climate, the leadership, the oh, uh, those it's, techniques it's all creative common share alike um uh first of all you'll find my book which is medium.com forward slash wardley maps it's all creative commons um and and then there's a whole bunch of people out there like uh doing teaching on this stuff like learn wardley maps there's about 13 or 14 books like the value um uh flywheel effect uh there's uh, uh books like uh, uh aws's uh reaching cloud velocity um uh, the, the, there's the un book on on, on large data systems um you'll find it just searching google um there's something called uh run by a chap called john grant uh list.wardleymaps.com uh, which is basically a community list, uh, which has links to loads of books and other sources as well. 
Um, but it's all Creative Commons share alike, so just help yourself. Thank you so much, Simon. Pleasure. Well, you on, and uh, thank you so much.